Okay, so this uh, series is entitled uh, Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is the first lesson in the series and it's entitled King Saul on the Edge of Greatness. Um, this series of lessons, uh, just to give you an idea of what you have come into here, this series of, of lessons profiles uh, the lives and the times of a lot of the kings who served as leaders of God's people. High profile, some of them very well known, some of them not so well known, as we said. Um, uh, but even the ones that we don't know very well, you know, like we know King Saul, we know King David, but there are others we don't know as much. Their names are not as familiar to us, but if they're in the Bible, if God has included them in the record of His uh, people, uh, usually there's a pretty good reason for that. Uh, usually there's a rich treasure of uh, human experience uh, that uh, we can learn from. You know, Paul the Apostle, in speaking about the lives of the Old Testament characters, said that their life experiences were recorded and kept as a teaching device for subsequent generations of believers. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, um, let me just get a slide up there. He says, now these things happen to them, meaning the people in the Old Testament, these things happen to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so we study the Old Testament for a lot of reasons, but studying characters, you know, the individual lives, the biographies of men and women in the Old Testament, uh, um, uh, studying that usually gives us an insight to how God you know, interacts with people because we see Him interacting with people. So we start this series you know, entitled Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times, where we're either going to look at the life or a specific episode in one of these kings rule and see if we can draw some practical lessons for our own lives as Christians in the lives we live today. So this series, you know, the last series we did was about doctrine and we learned about doctrine this series is more about people, and the takeaways are not going to be concepts. The takeaways from this class are going to be practical things that we can use in our own lives. Of course, these men, you know, they lived in very different social and cultural contexts that we do today. But you know, we share the same belief in God and the same desire to know and to do His will that they did. They prayed, Lord, please let me know what you want me to do. You know? And today, what do we pray? Please, Lord, let me know what you want me to do. So it's, you know, it's the same type of experience. Uh, we also share similar human natures, uh, weakened by sin and subject to temptation and failure, as well as uh, subject to forgiveness and restoration, as they did as well. Um, also, how God dealt with them is similar to how God deals with us today. And so examining their relationship with the Lord will be quite, I think, illuminating for us as well, because we have a relationship with the Lord that we're trying to develop as well. So we, um, let's see, there we go. So we begin with King Saul, uh, the first king of Israel appointed by God. And in studying his life, and reign in this and the next two lessons, because there's so much about him, I couldn't put it all into just uh, one lesson. Um, we're going to see how one person who began his service to the Lord as king, how that person managed to lose his bid for greatness because of personal weakness. In the end, Saul will teach us, actually he's going to teach us what not to do as a servant of God. A servant you know, who had great, great potential. I mean, boy, if anyone had potential, it was Saul. But he kind of just, you know, he dropped the ball. We're going to see uh, and uh, look at his life and see what happens. So the story of, uh, the story of Saul is uh, set in that time period when the Jews had entered the Promised Land after their wanderings in the desert for 40 years. Each tribe had been allotted you know, their territory and they were busy setting up cities and towns that were formerly held by the pagan nations that had previously inhabited the land which they inherited from God. So the Jews, you know, after a time, they had become less zealous in eradicating the nations 
according to God's original command through Moses. And instead of eradicating the nations and getting rid of them, wiping them out, they'd begun to make treaties with them and enslave them instead of eliminating them. And actually the, pr the problem there was they chose the easy way. It was a lot easier to make a treaty with them and to tax them and you know, uh, earn money off of their taxes and off of their labor than to go to war with them and completely destroy them. And God had told them what, what He wanted them to do was to destroy these pagan nations because if they didn't, uh, their influence would come back and pollute um, you know, their own uh, religion and their own uh, lifestyle. So they took the easy way. Uh, because of their disobedience, God sustained certain pagan nations uh, that they couldn't wipe out. And He used these pagan nations to punish the Jews for their stubbornness. And one such nation was the Philistines. Now they lived on a small strip of land along the Mediterranean coast and they were fierce enemies of the Jews for many decades. Today, where the Philistines live is called the Gaza Strip. Who lives there, right? Palestinians, they live there. And, and, and what are they doing to the Jews? <laughs> the same thing they were doing at the very beginning. It's amazing how history you know, mirrors itself thousands of years uh, later. So during this period of time, about a thousand years before Christ, uh, God ruled the Jews directly. It was a theocracy. And He ruled the Jews through laws and commands that He had given Moses that the people were to follow. And then from time to time, He would send a special leader or a savior. Uh, in the Bible, we call them judges. And these people would help the nation in their time of trial and trouble. So they'd disobey God, they'd be attacked, they'd be in all kinds of trouble. The people would cry out for some sort of help. God would raise up one of these leaders to come in and help them overcome their enemies. Now we read about these uh, people, these men and women, uh, in the book of Judges. People like Samson and Gideon and Deborah. These people were appointed by God for a special mission to lead or to rescue the people when they were in danger. Now the last and greatest of these judges was Samuel who was dedicated as a child by his parents to the service of the Lord. I think we're familiar with his story. Uh, he was the last great judge of Israel. And he was also a prophet. We, we read about that in 1 Samuel 3, verse 20, and also in Acts 3, 24. And he served as priest, offering up sacrifices on behalf of the people. So he had a kind of a multifaceted ministry, prophet and priest and you know, leader and so on and so forth. Now during his lifetime, this is an important background uh, fact here, during Samuel's lifetime of ministry, the Israelites were constantly attacked and threatened by their enemy, the Philistines. In his first book, 1 Samuel, Samuel describes the state of affairs taking place as the Jews suffered defeat after defeat at the hands of the Philistines. Now the climax occurs when the pagan nation actually captures the Ark of the Covenant from the Jews. They capture it and they bring it into their territory. Now we know that the Ark you know, was a, was a box-like container with angel statues on the top, on the cover, that housed the stone, originally inside were the stone tablets of the commandments, uh, Aaron's rod, you know, Moses' brother, the rod that budded there. Aaron's rod and also a jar containing manna. That's what was originally in the ark. By the time of 1 Samuel, the only thing that was left in the ark were the tablets, the commandments themselves. Now the Jews had come to believe that if this vessel was in their possession, they were invincible in battle. They had come to believe this, so long as we have the ark with us, we're good to go, nobody can beat us. Of course, it was obedience to the Lord and faith in the Lord that actually guaranteed the victory. That's what guaranteed the victory. But the Jews had wandered so far away from this reality and had begun to trust the object representing God's presence 
instead of God Himself. Almost like a lucky charm, right? People have a special medal. I've seen people have a religious medal and say, oh, this is my lucky medal. Oh boy, this is, you know, that's wrong in so many ways. <laughs> well, this is pretty much the attitude that they had. Boy, so long as we got this ark with us, psh, you know, this, is our, this is a guarantee we're going to win every battle. So the loss of the ark wasn't just losing a piece of their history. It was a great psychological blow to the Jews and it demoralized them because they thought, if our enemies can take the ark, well, they can take us. If they can walk right in and take the ark away from us, well, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to defeat us. So a little later on in Samuel chapters five to seven, we see how God punishes the Philistines for actually having taken the ark and keeping it to the point where they actually give the ark back to the Jews because it's causing so many problems for them. You know, one of the amusing stories is that they put the ark in the temple with their own God. You know, and they have the statue of their God in there and then when they go in the next day, the statue of their God has fallen off the shelf and is laying flat down in the, on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Then they start having illnesses and all kinds of, all kinds of problems. So in 1 Samuel 7, we see Samuel lead the nation in a period of repentance and restoration, which ultimately produced a temporary peace between themselves and their enemies and the Philistines and, and others. Remember, they had peace because they returned to the Lord, not because they won a battle against the Philistines. So later in life, Samuel appointed his sons as judges over Israel but his sons were not really anointed by God. They were just appointed by Samuel. He figures, well, you know, who else is going to be judge? Uh, my sons will be judges. And of course, we read in Samuel that his sons were corrupt as leaders uh, of, the, uh, of the people. They were crooks. And so it seemed to the nation that Samuel's sons would not be as effective in leadership as Samuel had been. So the people, and here's the key point, not waiting upon God's direction, demanded that Samuel appoint them a king to rule over the land. In other words, they took matters into their own hands. So there were two mistakes here. One mistake was that Samuel, instead of going to the Lord and asking the Lord, who will take my place? Will you raise up another leader? He didn't do that. He just went ahead and appointed his own sons as leaders. And then the second mistake was the nation of Israel, seeing that Samuel's sons were corrupt, instead of them going to the Lord and asking, Lord, please raise up a leader for us, they just brushed all that aside and said, you know what, we don't want these guys, they're corrupt. We want a king. And why did they want a king? Well, because they looked around at the other nations and the other nations, they had kings with the pomp and the ceremony and the glory of their king, they wanted a king too. So Samuel warns them uh, that a human king is going to create as many problems as he would solve. But the people were adamant in wanting a rulership style resembling that of their pagan neighbors. So God instructs Samuel to go ahead in his search for a Jewish king to lead the nation, and he reminds Samuel that in doing this thing, the Jewish people were not rejecting Samuel, or his sons even, um, they were actually rejecting God Himself, who had been their king. All right, so I've given you this little background information here. We haven't read all the verses in Samuel because we don't have time, but I've given you this kind of background of information to set up the idea of where does Saul come from? So these are the things that have been happening in the background that set the stage for anointing a king and the first king that they're going to anoint is Saul. So into this historical context steps Saul, the first human king of Israel. So the story of Saul's time as king is described in 1 Samuel chapter 9. So here we go, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to 1 Samuel chapter 9, and as always, I'll throw up the, the verses up on the screen as well, if you prefer doing that. 
So the story of Saul's time as king, as I say, described in 1 Samuel chapter 9. First of all, the choice of Saul as king. We begin with his original anointing by Samuel and Saul's reaction to that anointing. Let's read that. It says, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bichorath, the son of uh, Aphiah, the son of uh, a Benjamite, a mighty man of valor. He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man, and there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son Saul, take now with you one of the servants and arise, go search for the donkeys. He passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalishah, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come, let us return, or else my father will cease to be concerned about the donkeys and will become anxious for us. So we learn just from these opening verses that Saul was from the smallest of the tribes, uh, tribe of Benjamin, located uh, to the west of, in the west of Judah, near, nearest the Philistine nation. So his village was nearest where the Philistines uh, lived. Um, his father was respected for his courage and honor, and Saul himself was taller than average and good looking. Very rare in the Bible that the Bible describes you know, the, the, a person's physical appearance, very rare. You know, we have what for, for Saul, we have a little bit for David, uh, for Esther, that she was beautiful. For very few characters, however, the Bible describes. But here we're describing Saul as, as being tall and, and handsome. Uh, he was also quite attached to his father. And as we read the rest of the chapter, we're also going to find out that uh, although he believed in God and the law, we're going to see that he was not really well versed in the word itself and the commands of God. And many times he would rely on a servant to explain to him how one was to approach a prophet, for example. He had no, no idea. Now as the story of chapter nine continues, we see him and his servant detour from their original task of finding the lost donkeys to seeking a prophet who might give them help in their journey. Uh, you know, if that sounds strange to you, yeah, that is kind of strange. This was an unusual request for a prophet, and in it we see Saul's penchant for using spiritual powers to serve purely financial or physical needs. He, he doesn't ask the prophet to enlighten him, to give him a, a message from the Lord, he, he thinks, well, let's ask the prophet. He knows everything. Maybe he can tell us where the donkeys are. I mean, you see what I'm saying? A pretty, pretty down-to-earth type of, uh, of thinking. He was not a very spiritually minded man. So upon meeting him, Samuel reassures him that the animals are safe at home, and he continues by pronouncing a gracious blessing on Saul. And Saul, at this point, is confused and he's a little suspicious, and he responds kind of warily to Samuel's words. So let's keep reading 1 Samuel 9, 17 to 21. It says, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this one uh, shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me uh, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's household? Saul replied, I am, not a Benjamite of, uh, I am not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, uh, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Why then do you speak to me in this, in this way? See what I'm saying? So Samuel tells him about the donkeys 
before Saul even asks him about the donkeys. So right away, you know, oh, there's something going on here with the, uh, with the prophet. And then he says something very gracious to him, you know, that his family will be exalted, that he himself will be exalted. And Saul is like, whoa, you know, what's, what's going on here? So at the dinner that they share later on, Samuel will give to Saul the honored place at the table and the choicest portion signifying his new rule as leader. And then later on in chapter 10, Samuel anoints Saul as king and he describes to Saul several things that are going to take place that day which will prove that his appointment is from God. I mean, I, I, let's be a little sympathetic to Saul as well here. Here's a guy looking for some animals that have wandered away from his property and he bumps into a prophet who tells him, you know what, you're going to be the king. I mean, you know, I don't blame Saul at this point for being a little suspicious. And so to allay his fears and his suspicions, Samuel is going to prophesy. He's going to tell him in advance several things that are going to happen to Saul in the coming day as a way of confirming uh, that what um, um, Samuel is saying as a prophet is indeed uh, true. So he prophesies, first of all, that his animals have been found. Then he describes his father's feelings about him. He even explains in detail the people that he's going to meet and the events that will take place in the hours to come as he returns home. Now the most significant of these uh, things um, being the fact that at some point Saul will meet a group of prophets and Samuel tells him when he meets this group of prophets he himself will begin to prophesy along with them. Now this is significant. I mean remember now this is the person who didn't know how to approach a prophet. He told his he, said, he asked his servant, imagine his slave, how do you go about approaching a prophet? He didn't even know how to approach a prophet and now Samuel said to him, this very day you're going to speak like a prophet as a way of demonstrating to Saul what was going to take place and also the power of Samuel's uh, predictions. So all of these signs Samuel gives him to confirm that his anointing is from God. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Now finally, after all of this is explained, Samuel instructs Saul on what he must do in response. So that's the next passage in chapter 10, verse eight. Again, I'm summarizing big sections of Samuel here because we don't have time to read the whole story. And I think many of you are familiar with this story. So in chapter 10, verse eight, he says, and you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. Now, I want you to remember this command because we're going to come back to it in our next lesson. Okay? So after his meeting with Samuel, Saul returns home and he experiences all the things predicted by Samuel, but he doesn't repeat to his family what took place concerning his anointing as king. He's still reluctant to believe and accept what has taken place. Yeah, he's seen all the miraculous, well, miraculous, that's a strong word, but he's seen all the prophecies being fulfilled about him in that one day. But he's not ready to come home and say to his father, his father say, yeah, hey, hey the donkeys came back. Oh, that's nice. So, how was your day? And Saul was said, well, you know, it was, you know, it was an okay day. I, by the way, I was anointed as king of the nation. You know, he wasn't ready to, he wasn't ready to do that. Okay? And so in chapter 10, verse 17 and forward, we see about the public selection of Saul as king. So you know, the, the, the prophet anoints him privately, gives him you know, heavenly signs, if you wish, that his anointing is, is, is true but then there has to be a public anointing. And so in order to do that, Samuel calls a gathering of all the people and he begins by chastising them for having rejected the Lord's rulership over them and choosing an earthly king instead. And then he informs them that despite this rejection, God has granted their request 
and he will furnish them with a king. Now Saul proceeds to take lots from among the tribes to narrow the field and then from the heads of the families in order to narrow it down to one particular person and even through this process Saul comes out as the chosen one. Now you need to understand the people all they see is a drawing of lots to choose a leader, right? They have lots, they, you know, out of the 12 tribes, they pick one straw, whoop, the, the short straw, uh, you know, we don't know exactly how they did, oh, the short straw goes to the tribe of Benjamin, okay, another bunch of straw, whoop, the short straw goes to the family of so-and-so, another, whoop, the short straw goes to Kish, whoop, the short straw goes to Saul, the son of, you see what I'm saying? There's all random, random drawings in front of the people, because the people, they're thinking, okay, the, the, the prophet, this is how he's going to whittle down the contenders, if you wish, to the one who will be anointed. But to Saul, who's watching this, he's seeing yet another manifestation of the proof that God has chosen him, because even through this random process, it still comes about that he's the one who's chosen as the king. And once again, we see Saul's reluctance because when the people search for him to inform him of his being chosen, what, where do they find him? Well, he's in the baggage area hiding among, hiding among the suitcases. So let's read a small portion, 1 Samuel um, uh, verses 21 to 24. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families and the uh, Matrite family was taken and Saul the son of Kish was taken, but when they looked for him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? So the Lord said, behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. Uh, let's see if I have another passage. Yeah. So they ran and took him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Samuel said to all the people, do you see him who the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Now after he was chosen, we see that there are some, some people among the group, among the crowd, who refuse to accept him from day one, and others who become devoted to him and urged to do so by God's hand and influence in their hearts. So like any, any, like any political thing, the minute you, you select the leader, what happens? Some people don't like that guy. They're not his guy, and that's exactly what happens here. I want you to remember that also, because that factors into something as we go along. Now, if you were writing a book about Saul's life and his reign as king, a good title for that book would be On the Edge of Greatness. This title would work because very early on, Saul showed the glimmer of being a great king and a great man of God. Samuel describes his finest hour in chapter 11, beginning in verse one. So let's read that. It says, Now Nahash the Ammonite came up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, I will make it with you on this condition, that I will gouge out the right eye of every one of you, uh, thus I will make it a, a reproach on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Let us alone for seven days that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to deliver us, we will come out to you. Then the messengers came to uh, 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 Giba of Saul and spoke these words in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen and he said, what is the matter with the people that they weep? So they related to him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily when he heard these words and he became very angry. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell on the people and they came out as one man. He numbered them in Bezek, and the sons of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. They said to the messengers who had come, thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow, by the time of the sun is hot, you will have deliverance. 
So the messengers went and told the men of Jabesh and they were glad. Then the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will come out to you and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. The next morning Saul put the people in three companies and they came into the midst of the camp at the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said to Samuel, who is he that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may, uh, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So Saul manages to rise to the occasion and the challenge of the enemy. He galvanizes his forces and wages a completely successful war against the Ammonites. And then when victory is in his hand, he shows that he can be gracious by sparing the lives of those who were opposed to his selection on that day. Remember I said there were some, when he was anointed king, who said, hey, he's not our king. That's not the guy we want. And then after he proves his, you know, uh, his courage and so on and so forth, wins the battle, then the people on his side say, oh, hey, let's go find those people who didn't want you to be kin. Let's take care of business right now. Let's wipe them out. And what does he do? No, not on this day. He was gracious to his enemies on this day because it was a day of victory. It was, he wanted to give glory to God for the victory and that would have spoiled that particular uh, offering uh, to the Lord. And then, as I said, finally he gives glory to God for the victory and he shows great spiritual leadership at a critical moment in the nation's history. So we see this very happy episode end. Um, um, it ends well. And, and the people then unanimously confirm Saul, anointing him as king with sacrifices and joyful praise to God. It's like a happy ending. You know, it's like a happy ending to, to a movie. And so the chapter ends with a final warning by Samuel to the people that in order to continue the blessings and the protection of the Lord, they and their new king must obey and serve him only. If not, even their new king won't be able to save them. So we leave off the story for this week in our class with Saul at the high point of his rule, having consolidated his power and position with the people through this swift victory and statesmanlike conduct towards his detractors. All is well in Israel for the moment, but in our next lesson we're going to begin to look at Saul's tragic decline into madness. Now even though Saul lived you know, 3,000 years ago, we can draw some pretty relevant lessons which apply to our own lives today just from this opening here. I mean, we haven't gotten into the meat of the matter as far as his life is concerned, just from this opening story of his selection and his first victory. There are some pretty good life lessons here. Lesson number one would be, the world usually rejects God's servants. You know, Saul was not unanimously accepted at first, and even he himself had trouble believing that God had chosen him. You know, this is quite normal for those who are called into God's service. <laughs> they doubt themselves. They're not always accepted by other people. It happens, it even happens in the church. I mean, you know, we go through a selection process and perhaps we choose uh, an elder and we install a, a new elder, a couple of elders. You always hear some people you know, that have a little bit of back talks. So, well, I don't know about that guy, man. I saw him once, he lost his temper. I don't even think he should be an elder and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, nothing has changed. Human nature is the same. If you've become a Christian, or if you've tried to convince others of your faith, don't be surprised if not too many are happy for you. <laughs> I remember when I, Lisa and I, we became you know, Christians pretty much at the same time, within months of each other. And we were so happy. I mean, it was so wonderful, this new life in Christ. And 
It's, we would read the Bible and, say, and we'd say, oh, look at this, look at this. I never knew this, I never saw this. You know, it was so crystal clear. How could anybody miss it? Until we tried to share that with our family. <laughs> the best reaction, the very best reaction we had was something like, oh, that's nice for you. But good for you. you know? Just don't bring your thing, whatever it is, over to my house. Kind of a polite rejection. And then after a while it was, look, we don't want to hear about the Bible anymore. Uh, somebody, said, somebody in my family said, you know, I know that you know the Bible well, and when I want to know something in the Bible, I'll call you. But until that time, don't even bother opening it. And at the time, boy, I was so hurt, I was so, oh, I was so demoralized, you know, like all the air let out of a balloon. I didn't have a lot of experience as a Christian, but after a while I realized, oh, of course, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. The world doesn't applaud you for becoming a Christian. If you stake a claim to be with God, to now walk with the Lord in obedience or service, this means that you've rejected the world and you've rejected the values of the world. Don't be surprised if the world's not happy with you. Be prepared for the world to reject you back, to disown you because of your faith. Another lesson from this first episode, be careful what you ask for. The people against God's wishes asked for a king and Samuel warned them that a human king would devour their wealth through taxes would take their daughters as servants and wives and turn their sons into soldiers in order to prosecute, in order to, uh, to conduct wars. For what? Well, for more land and more wealth and so on and so forth. But they insisted. They could have said, hmm, Samuel, well maybe you're right. I mean, you've been our judge you know, for 30, 40 years and you've never steered us wrong. Maybe you're right in this too. Maybe we should reconsider that. Maybe we should pray and ask the Lord to raise up a new leader for us. You know, they didn't do that. No, they insisted. That's what we want. And so they received their king and all of the problems along with the king. So what's the lesson for us today? Well, God will allow you to pursue people and things that are bad for you if you insist on doing it. If we continue to resist what our conscience is saying, you know, your conscience is saying, uh, excuse me, I don't think you ought to be doing that. Shh, 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 shh. quiet. <laughs> I'm going to, I turn up the sound of the music to drown out the voice of my conscience. If you insist on going against your conscience, if you insist on going against God's word, you'll get your way. God will let you do. Unless you are intensely seeking His will in a certain matter, He's going to allow you to chase after and obtain your heart's desire, even if it destroys you. You see, that's the downside of free will. Free will is what animates us. Free will is what separates us from the animals and the rocks and the trees. That's the good part. The bad part is that free will also can permit us to choose what is wrong and thus destroy us. This is why Jesus instructs us to pray. He says, lead us not into temptation, Matthew 6, 13, so that God will help us seek after those things that come from above and not simply the things that come from below. Okay, third lesson. Wait for God's anointing. This is the hard one. This is the tricky one. Note in the story that Samuel tried to anoint his own sons to succeed him and they were unsuitable for leadership. He failed to remember his own experience where God had called him to serve as a judge and prophet and priest and not Eli the priest he had served under as a boy. Note also that the people chose for themselves the type of leader to succeed Samuel, not waiting for God to send them a messenger or a successor. So they received the king, but only by default. Had they waited for God's anointing, they would have saved themselves a whole lot of trouble. So God's anointing is God's blessing. 
is God's choice, is God's way. And sometimes we can know it because it is clearly spelled out in His word. You know, Thou shalt not kill. It's easy. Should I, I hate that guy. I, I think I'm going to kill that guy. You know? Well, the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. You know, some decisions are pretty easy. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It doesn't mean we don't steal, commit adultery, and kill. It's just, it's pretty clear that we're doing something wrong when we do those things. But sometimes, you know, it's do I move to Boston or New York? Do I take the new job or not? Do I get married now or later? Do I have this friend or that? You know, sometimes the decisions are not like black and white. Sometimes in those cases, the word provides us with principles to guide us. And sometimes, and this is the hard one, sometimes we just have to wait for events and circumstances to move in order to know what is God's anointing. Whether it be a call to ministry or finding a marriage partner or deciding on a career or a move or a purchase, if we seek God's anointing and are patient to wait for it, we'll get it. You know, when Jesus says, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and it'll, it shall be open, Matthew 7, 7, He's not talking to you about cars or money or health, you know, seek health, seek money, that's not what He's talking about. He's talking about the anointing. If you're seeking God's anointing, God's will, if you're knocking on the door trying to find out what God's will is, if you're searching, for God's will, he said, you, you're going to find it. Ask, seek, knock in your search for God's way for you in your life and you will receive the answer and you will find the way and you will discover the right door that God will, that God will open for you. And so that's, you know, that, that's certainly one, I think, uh, very prominent lesson from Saul. He didn't wait for the anointing. He didn't wait to know. He just barreled ahead. And a lot of times we do the same things. Instead of waiting, we barrel ahead. And many times we make a tragic mistake when we do. So some very good life lessons, I think, from Saul. Just the very beginning of his reign, we can draw some good stuff. I believe we'll be able to continue to do that as we, uh, as we go forward in our study of Saul and other kings that we can learn from. That's our lesson for this morning. Thank you for your attention.